I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to discuss more about the upcoming elections, joining us now is Adam Berkowitz, a journalist from Israel 365 News, who is covering uh, prophecies, things unfolding on a daily basis. Hello, and thanks for joining us, Adam. Hi, Emily. It's really a pleasure. It's good to see you on TV. We talk all the time on the phone, as you know, you just heard from this piece. You know, it is very interesting to be, you know, looking at everything happening from the perspective of us, both of us being Americans, being so far away, but having kind of the, the objective view as to what's really happening. How do you best encapsulate from your perspective, you know, what is happening right now, you know, with America and how it is fitting into all of these prophecies, that, you know, of Isaiah and whatnot being fulfilled right now during these times? Well, you, you pointed, you, as you said, this is these are prophetic times. And the interesting thing about prophecy is we know the end. We know what's going to happen. The, the two questions you have to ask are, how do we get there? What's, what's going to be the pathway to get there? And how do I fit into this? And in this, elections are very clearly that. The question is, which side are you on? And each side represents a very specific power. Um, Donald Trump has, has attached himself to Jerusalem, has attached himself to Israel in a very clear way, and Joe Biden has not. It is so much more, you know, beyond, you know, Trump. I think, you know, you've written a lot of articles and being equated to King Cyrus, doing a lot of things, moving the embassy, all of these things. It doesn't, you know, explain, you know, this is a guy who, you know, you lived in New York a long time. I lived in New York. Mm -hmm. He's able, he's doing things that are under our noses. Now, and I know this isn't a standpoint of we're tro pro one versus the other, but explain why why what he's done is kind of inadvertently, you know, pushing things through in the back door, even though it may not be coming out of the goodness of his heart. Okay, so you, as you said, Trump, Trump is very much like King Cyrus. I was in New York City um, when Trump was just starting out. He was a young playboy, um, certainly not a godly character. However, um, we frequently see that the greatest redemptions, the greatest light, is hidden from the dark side, lest the dark side come along and destroy it. We see that Moses, his his parents were relatives, and there's a question about whether that was kosher or not. We see King David, his grandmother uh, Ruth was was a Moabite, uh, and that was questionable. Trump, he's a questionable character. No one would look at Trump and say this guy will bring redemption. But meanwhile, Cyrus brought redemption. Um, brought the brought the second temple. Trump is also doing that, and he's doing amazing, miraculous things in plain sight. He's bringing peace to the Middle East. If anyone else had done this, it would have been front page news blasting it for 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 months. Trump has done it, and no one has even noticed. He can bring amazing things with no one noticing it. Right. Also, you know, there's a portion in, you know, in the, the parsha of Balak, you know, there's, you know, who, you know, yeah. wasn't even a Jew. There's a whole parsha, uh, you know, named after him. You know, are, can that also be equated? Because, again, we don't want to, it's not about sounding like Trump is better than Biden in, in any way. I mean, this election clearly is bringing up a lot of raw motions well, in America right now on the both Talmud sides. Actually says, the Talmud actually says that on a certain level, um, Bilam was on a higher level of prophecy than Moses, um, and he was that close to Hashem. Um, he used it for bad ends, and we can see that that um, the, the 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 heart of the king is 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 like water in God's hands. I've seen Trump; he's changed drastically over the last four years. Whoever becomes the leader, a leader, a king of Israel is the um, the he facilitates. He's the he's the the 
the tube, the, the channel for God's light into a nation. And that changes the, the leader. So I think Donald Trump is certainly uh, certainly fits this description. Now let's talk about the whole idea of you know the outcome of the election. I mean, we look, we know we're talking about we're we're in the end of days. We are in the time of woman, the woman. We're seeing all this. You know, we have a female candidate. But you're saying from the standpoint, from your point of view, it's really not about gender and choosing gender. Really, explain like from Hashem's point of view. It's not relevant. Uh, there's a switch that's going on. When we see um, Biden and Kamala Harris, there's a kind of switch going on where you're not really sure who's going to be the president. Uh, interestingly enough, the two of them together have a very interesting meaning. Um, Kamala, um, her name is actually the letters of Amalek. Wow. Uh, which, which is, is doubt. as we know, the uh, Amalek is doubt, exactly. And it's also the perennial. Uh, enemy of Israel. Um, her last name, Harris, in Hebrew, uh, is the same letters as Harris, Heish Re Samich, which means destruction. Biden is Bidin, meaning in judgment. Judgment is a difficult thing. Um, and also his name, Joe, it's interesting that he doesn't go by the name Yosef, which is a biblical name, um, someone who saves uh, other foreign nations as well as Israel and connects Israel to other nations. He goes by Joe, which is Gimel Vav, which is the beginning of the name Gog, uh, as wow. we know, Gogo Magog. Uh, Donald Trump, interestingly enough, is um, Gematria uh, 424, uh, in Hebrew numerology, and that is Mashiach ben David. Wow. And uh, many rabbis have understood that as not that he is Messiah, but that he is preparing the way for the Messiah. Right. So we see that there's um, there's very strong things. What's for sure is this is going to be a very powerful election. Um, I think it's gone beyond reason, and it's very much a matter of personal identity. Who do you identify with? What side? <laughs> Who would have thought we're living in crazy times? We Thank certainly God. are. Daniel 2, 20 and 21. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Daniel 12, 9 and 10. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Just as Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end, the Apostle John was told, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Revelation 22, 10 and 11. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He was righteous, let him be righteous still. He was holy, let him be holy still. Psalm 1, 1 through 6, tells us the way of the righteous in the end of the ungodly. Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What did Jesus say or teach about hell? Hell is a fiery furnace. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of outer darkness, sorrow, and pain. 
Matthew 22:13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is eternal. Matthew 25, 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 24 through 26. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Hell is a place of separation. Luke 16.26 And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The Bible speaks of the reality of hell in the same terms as the reality of heaven. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In fact, Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did in comforting them with the hope of heaven. The concept of a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in hell is just as biblical as a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in heaven. Trying to separate them is simply not possible from a biblical standpoint. The good news is, no one has to go to hell. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Daniel put it succinctly, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Which do you choose, everlasting life or shame and everlasting contempt? It's up to you, eternity with God or eternity in the lake of fire. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, 
but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. For an accurate read on the political pulse in America, don't check the ballot boxes. Count the ammunition boxes. Ahead of the U.S. election, Americans are buying guns in unprecedented numbers. In expectation among some sectors of the population of massive civil unrest once the result is known. Uh, you had the rioters in the streets, but you also had the police standing down. And when a group of police officers are ordered to not intervene in the damage and destruction of honest citizens' properties, honest citizens will intervene next time. While no central figures exist, the FBI says they process close to 30 million firearms background checks this year to date, each one done when a gun is sold. Private firms estimate that the real number might be closer to 17 million. Those numbers still eclipse all previous years. And the year is not over yet. Uncertainty over the coronavirus pandemic created a run on guns. More than four months of rioting and racial unrest spiked those sales to a fever pitch. Because of everything that's happened this year so far, whether it's, again, the pandemic itself, whether it's racist violence, which is a longstanding pandemic, whether it's unease about the election, um, I think, again, that those things are causes for spikes. Across the United States, some Americans are preparing for violence in the aftermath of what many expect to be a highly charged election in a year that already has seen politically motivated murders. You know, it's your right, it's your duty as a, a citizen in the United States of America to be able, you know, one, to defend your person and your property, but also to work with other like-minded people to protect your country. You know, for Militias on both the left and the right have declared their intention to take to the streets if they feel their candidate has been cheated. Nor are the new gun sales relegated to the usual demographics. Gun stores report that African-American women and Democrats make up the bulk of first-time buyers. But the tense climate is a nightmare for law enforcement trying to weed out legitimate threats from rising political tempers. We live in a time where people are radicalized to violence, not only to the actually committing acts of violence, but move from a relatively normal state of mind to a radicalized ideology very quickly. And so that creates a lot of challenges for law enforcement. Storekeepers are already preparing in the expectation of post-election riots, but the potential for armed bloodshed has never been higher. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. As students rush to get out of Kabul University, gunshots could be heard close by. <laughs> Witnesses say attackers entered the campus through its north gate and started shooting indiscriminately. We saw them when they entered. They were shooting at every student they saw. They even shot at students who were running away. A few of us managed to leave the scene through another gate. Security forces quickly surrounded the campus, but it took them hours to bring the situation under control as parents of students trapped inside waited for news. I was downtown when I heard from people that there was a suicide attack at Kabul University. I got here so quickly and started ringing my son's phone. I don't know whether he's in class or somewhere else in the university campus. I asked him where he is, but he just told me to pray for him. The attack happened during a book exhibition by Afghan and Iranian publishers. No one has claimed responsibility. The Taliban says its fighters are not involved. This is the second attack on a school or university in the last 10 days. While government and Taliban negotiators meet in Qatar to broker a peace deal, violence continues to affect the lives of many Afghans. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return, as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Chanting freedom and this is theft, hundreds of people have taken to the streets of Barcelona to protest against tough coronavirus lockdown restrictions that include a 10pm curfew and a ban on leaving hometowns over the weekend. The measures imposed by the government of Spain and the Catalonian authorities don't have any logic to them, said this protester. What they should do is take more measures for hospitals, provide them with staff and material to help them to overcome this pandemic, not impose measures of social control on us. There were violent clashes with police that led to at least 12 people being arrested. Bars and restaurants have been closed in Catalonia since the middle of October and the authorities are now increasing controls to enforce travel restrictions. More than 35,000 people have been killed in Spain by the COVID-19 pandemic. Even for a country used to 20 typhoons a year, these winds were different. A super typhoon with speeds of 225 kilometers per hour battered the eastern Philippines on Sunday. In some places, gusts hit up to 310 kilometers per hour, equivalent to a Category 5 hurricane, the highest classification there is. One of the world's largest typhoons of the year, Typhoon Goni, struck the Philippines on Sunday morning local time, killing at least 10 people. The super typhoon is the 18th tropical storm to hit the country this year, and it comes only days after Typhoon Malave swept through the country. Super typhoon Typhoon Goni made landfall in the Philippines on Sunday morning local time, leaving at least 10 people dead. Of the strongest typhoons to hit the country, it comes just days after Typhoon Molave, which killed 22 people. According to the Office of Civil Defense in the Bicol region, Typhoon Goni slammed through an area located on the main Luzon Island, southeast of Manila, traveling at 225 kilometers per hour. The governor of the region reported 10 deaths from the super typhoon, with some dying from an overflowing river and one killed by a falling tree. According to authorities, almost 400,000 people were displaced in the Bicol region, and almost 350,000 of them were evacuated to government-run evacuation centers as well as school gyms. Officials say there are added concerns over the use of evacuation shelters amid the outbreak of COVID-19. In addition, power supplies were cut off in 10 towns as well as Manila after trees were toppled by powerful winds. Manila's main airport was also forced to shut down until Monday, with airlines required to cancel domestic and international flights. The disaster-prone country previously experienced a deadly typhoon back in 2013, with Typhoon Haiyan leaving more than 7,000 people dead or missing and damaging more than 4 million homes. Meanwhile, Typhoon Kuni has left the Philippines after weakening to a tropical storm late on Sunday. However, the National Weather Agency has warned of another possible typhoon coming up after Goni. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. 
and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Three days after a devastating earthquake, Turkish rescuers fall silent. They're hoping to hear sounds of survivors under the rubble in the city of Izmir, where the death toll has risen to 69. This survivor says there were at least 50 people in her building, which collapsed. There was a cafe downstairs, she continues. I saw them escape. During the first tremor, they went outside. I didn't see anything else. There was dust and smoke within seconds. On Sunday night, rescuers were still working at eight partially collapsed buildings in the hope of pulling people out alive. The earthquake claimed fewer lives in Greece, but the physical damage is just as visible here on the island of Samos, where two teenagers were killed. Some families are being housed in makeshift camps in Samos, as aftershocks continue to rock this part of the Aegean. Daniel 9:26 and 27 And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. Are we seeing any signs of a covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies today? The recent historical Middle East peace deals to the Abraham Accords to the U.S. Embassy's move to Jerusalem. U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman has seen historic changes over the past four years. Friedman sat down for an exclusive interview with CBN News about what could be on the horizon. Just days after the first commercial flight from the United Arab Emirates to Israel, Ambassador Friedman addressed the future of the Abraham Accords. It seems to be coming to a crescendo. President Trump has said maybe 10 nations are in line. Uh, what's next and uh, who's next? Well, you know, you can pull out a map and come up with some pretty good guesses as to uh, who's next. I think all the, all the regional players are, are in discussion. Uh, I don't want to speak for them or uh, betray any confidences or their sensitivities, but you know, the president is correct. There are five to ten countries that are uh, in active discussions with us. They have everything to gain by joining this circle of peace. They have nothing to lose. Uh, looking at the impact of the Abraham Accords on the region, what, what do you see in a year, two, five years? What, what could change here in the region? Look, I think we are um, at the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. You know, you have so many people that are already on board. It's just, you know, the, the, the narrative, the old narrative, the old grievances kind of collapses on itself. And, um, and I think we're really at the beginning of a very um, hopeful period uh, in the Middle East. 
As an observant Jew, Ambassador Friedman often looks at the Middle East through the lens of the Bible. The original Abraham Accords was the reconciliation between Isaac and Ishmael. You know, Isaac was, uh, was the second son of Abraham, Ishmael was the first, they were rivals, and Isaac and Ishmael uh, reconciled before Abraham passed away, and we're doing that again 3,500 years later, and I think that that's an appropriate uh, uh, Bible story, Bible lesson for, uh, for today. Former Vice President Biden and Senator Harris have said that if they're elected, they would renew the Iranian nuclear deal. What impact would that, that have on Israel and the region? It would be a complete disaster. Um, Iran is a very dangerous country. We have made Iran far less dangerous than they were four years ago. And they're, they're pulling back. They will continue to pull back, I believe, if we keep the sanctions on. The worst thing we can do right now when we have them on the ropes is to let the pressure off. When you look back on the last four years, what achievements do you, uh, stand out to you? You know, I think that moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, right here, this is my, my office in, uh, in our Jerusalem embassy, I think that was um, really the, uh, the most important thing the president did, uh, not just because uh, you know, we all believe that Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. It's the message that the move sent to the world, that President Trump stands with his friends, stands on principle, keeps a promise, and it resonated throughout the world. And I believe that it set our foreign policy on the right track everywhere. It may seem counterintuitive to people, but you know we believe this would lead to peace, and it did. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. There has never been a stronger push for peace in the Middle East than we are seeing right now. I believe that very soon the Antichrist will step onto the world stage and strongly enforce peace between Israel and the rest of the Muslim world. And with it, will come the rapture of the church. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.